Well, welcome everybody. Um, it's uh, great to be back talking about uh, procurement and accessibility once again. This is a webinar that we offer a couple times a year, and usually there's some fresh new information to share um, over a six month period. And so I think uh, that might be the case uh, this time, some new examples and some new insights. Um, and I'm, I'm Cheryl Thompson. I am a manager of the IT accessibility team within UWIT Accessible Technology Services. And I'm joined by Lynn McGill. You want to say hi, Lynn? Hello, everyone. I am Lynn McGill. I'm the assistant director of procurement for the academy side of the university. And as you can imagine, uh, things are very busy right now in procurement, so I really appreciate Lynn um, joining us today. I'm um, taking an, an hour out of her time to talk about accessibility. So let me share slide deck. So we are here to talk about accessibility and procurement, and there will be a few acronyms which will clarify um, later on in the presentation, but just to give you a heads up that they're coming, uh, we'll talk about the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, who is the, the organization that owns um, various standards related to accessibility, uh, including the, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, as it's affectionately known. And ARIA is another uh, specification of theirs, um, Accessible Rich Internet Applications, which plays an important role in uh, web accessibility. And a big part of what we're gonna be talking about today is the VPAT or Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. Um, getting a little, bit of, a little bit of noise on the line. I think I'm gonna selectively mute. Okay. So the, uh, the heart of what we're gonna be talking about is documented on our procurement uh, policies and procedures page on the Accessible Technology website. That is at uw.edu slash access tech slash procurement. Um, and that page is organized by three sort of big uh, steps where accessibility plugs in nicely into the procurement process. And our presentation today is also going to be organized according to those three steps. So step one is solicit accessibility information. So as you are um, you know, shopping for a product or talking to vendors about a product or going out to RFP, then that's an important time to ask about accessibility. Um, you know, is your product accessible? Can you provide documentation to support that? And we're going to talk about that step. Step two is to validate the accessibility information received. So once you ask about accessibility, you'll get some sort of answer back um, from the vendor, and you need to be able to ascertain whether that answer uh, makes sense, whether you can trust it, um, with, and, and what sort of implications arise out of that answer. Um, is this a product that is going to present some risk, uh, maybe major risk, due to its accessibility failures, or is it a product that seems to be uh, accessible based on not only their answer, but your validation of their answer? We'll spend a lot of time talking about step two. And finally, step three is to include accessibility assurances in contracts. So I'm going to talk about the first two. Lynn is going to talk about the third. And let's move on to step one then. Solicit accessibility information. So on that procurement web page, um, we actually have some sample language for an RFP. And this is a big block of text on the slide. Uh, I won't read it all. Um, but you can, if you're curious, you can read, read that on the, the web page. It actually is quoting from UW Procurement Policy 7.2.15, which guides uh, a lot of what procurement services does related to accessibility. The, there are a few words that are bolded here, a few phrases bolded here in this text. Um, but essentially, it says, University of Washington bidders and vendors 
shall be required to demonstrate that information technology provided to the UW conforms to our accessibility standards. And the accessibility standards that we need to meet are the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, version 2.1, level 2A. And a means by which vendors are uh, often um, disclosing how well they meet WCAG 2.1, level 2A, is the VPAT, the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. And so we will accept that. Um, and specifically VPAT 2.3 or higher. Um, and so what, is, what does all that mean? That's what we're gonna get into in the next few slides. There's some additional language here in this recommended language for the RFP that talks a little bit more about our expectations. Um, you know, we don't want them just to provide us with a VPAT. We want them to provide us with a good VPAT. And you're gonna see the differences in bad VPATs and good VPATs and why we have some specific instructions here uh, as we go on and look at a few examples. So in order to understand a VPAT, first you have to understand the standards, at least generally, um, WCAG 2.1 level 2A, the standards that we're trying to meet. So this goes back a long way, uh, WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, they were developed by the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C, in the early days of the web. So the web was created in the early 90s. Uh, the World Wide Web Consortium was founded in the early 90s. And immediately they recognized that the web could erect barriers for people with disabilities, and that was not the intention. The intention from the get-go when Tim Berners-Lee created the very first web page was that this was going to be a great equalizer and people all over the world were going to have information at their fingertips in, in ways that were unprecedented. So the fact that maybe some people could be shut out of that revolutionary new development, uh, that wasn't uh, at all in keeping with the vision. So they started a, a group, another acronym, WAI, Web Accessibility Initiative, was founded in order to address this. And they worked throughout the 90s on guidelines related to accessibility, and they published the first version in 1998. So that was WCAG 1.0. Second version, 2.0, was published 10 years later. And another version, 2.1, was published in 2018. So that's where we are currently. There is a 2.2 on the horizon, but 2.1 is the version, is the latest version and the version that we have state policy that requires that we meet. So 2.1 is, is our target. Within WCAG, there are, there are guidelines and there are various other layers within the document, but at, at its deepest level, you have success criteria and those are essentially checkpoints related to accessibility, specific measurable checkpoints. And there are 78 of those. So it gets into a lot of detail um, describing how to make web content accessible. And each of those success criteria ha has a level associated with it. And that has to do with priority. Level A are, are the most critical issues or the easiest to attain. It's kind of a combination of both of those things that go into the level assignments. Um, level A are the you know, highest priority and easiest. Level 2A is kind of a middle level and level 3A are either the less critical or the more difficult. And early um, when this was released, there was a lot of discussion about which level is appropriate? You know, do we have to meet all all levels, all seventy eight success criteria, or you know, is it just level A, or is it level A and two A? And through legal action as well as policies that have arisen in response to the, the legal actions, um, it has become clear that level two A is the bar. That is what we're expected to meet. So, uh, so level a and 2A fall into that. That's 50 success criteria um, that we, we need to meet. So that sounds like a lot. Um, I like to narrow it down to just three um, because it, it really, you know, it's a, it's a tall ask for everybody who has anything to do with digital content to master all the success criteria. 
But if you just understand three, that gives you some good ground to you know, understand the basics of accessibility and to be able to read a VPAT, uh, which comes later, um, and, and make some sense of that. So the first success criteria that I want to focus on is 1.3.1, info and relationships. It's a level A success criterion. And I've included this because it is so critical. Um, we're not supposed to say that any of these are more critical than others. They're all supposed to be, at least at level A, they're all supposed to be equally critical. Um, but arguably, the stuff that's included in this success criteria are really critical, um, like having headings explicitly coded as headings. For a screen reader user, they depend on having the outline of the page um, yeah, explicitly coded so they can jump from heading to heading to heading and understand the, the outline of the page, understand the relationships between the parts. Same thing if they're filling out a form, they need to understand what the labels are that go with each of the form fields. And that can be obvious to, to sighted users, but not so obvious to somebody who is navigating linearly through a form. So that needs to be explicitly coded in the markup. Same thing with tables. Maybe you've got column headers that need to be explicitly coded as column headers in order for a screen reader user to understand the table. So there are many, many other examples that fall into this, but basically having good structure in the code um, really, really helps you know, screen reader users as well as people using speech input and, and other um, users with disabilities. So this is a really important one, and that's why um, it's included. The second is 2.1.1 uh, keyboard also a level A, and that basically means that all functionality of the content is operable through a keyboard interface. So if you can access something with a mouse, you should also be able to access that with a keyboard. You should be able to tab through the interface, uh, maybe press enter or space to click on things, maybe the arrow keys, maybe the escape key all play some role, um, but that should all be uh, intuitive um, and, and attainable um, without touching your mouse. So, so I encourage you actually to take the no mouse challenge, try your website, your software application, whatever it may be, you should be able to use it with a keyboard. Um, don't touch your mouse. Um, try to go a whole day without touching your mouse and see you know, uh, which applications are easy to use and which ones um, pose challenges. The third success criterion is 4.1.2. This is name, role, and value. It also is level A. And essentially what this means is proper use of ARIA. Um, so in order to understand that, obviously you need to know what ARIA is. So ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. It once again is a W3C specification. And with this, they essentially have, have added some new markup that gets attached to HTML and goes beyond what HTML is capable of. Um, and that specifically is intended to make user interfaces more accessible, particularly if they are dynamic, interactive um, interface uh, web applications. Um, and so, Let's look at just a, a really simple example. Even if you're not a coder, hopefully this will be simple. What we have here is, is an accordion widget. You've got a button. It's coded here with a button, HTML tag, and a slash button that closes it. And in between that, you've got more info. So this is the more info button. So just imagine what this would actually look like on a web page. It's a button that says more info. And then you've got a div or just a division or a section of content um, that has an ID of info one. And it has some text inside it that says, this section contains more info. So let's imagine that that is hidden by default and a screen reader user lands on this button and it's announced as more info button. And they click on that by pressing the space bar or enter. And that exposes this previously hidden content. So a sighted user, if they were to click on that button with a mouse, 
new content appears, they read the new content. Um, for a screen reader user, they click on the button and they have no indication that anything has happened. They don't know that new content was exposed and they don't know where to find it. So this in and of itself is not an accessible interface and this is all you can do with HTML. But if we add just two ARIA attributes, ARIA controls, which points to the ID of the controlled content. So that's saying this button controls this content. And we add ARIA expanded, which is false by default. If the content is hidden, then, you know, this, this is not expanded. And then, you know, user clicks on it, the content is exposed, and then ARIA expanded would change to true. So now a screen reader user lands on that button, they hear more info button, they click it, and they hear expanded, which tells them that by clicking on this button, something has just happened, it has expanded, and there's new content available. Some screen readers also provide functionality that lets you jump directly to that exposed content. Otherwise, if it's immediately beneath the button, um, then you know, they can just arrow down um, to access that. So you don't need to know all the ins and outs of ARIA, and there are you know, lots and lots of other attributes that can get added to HTML that improve accessibility. The only thing you really need to know um, for the purposes of evaluating VPATs is that ARIA exists, and that if an application is dynamic and interactive, ARIA is going to play some some role in making that accessible. There's, there's really no way of getting uh, around that. So what is a VPAT then? Uh, it stands for Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. Sometimes it's called an accessible Accessibility Conformance Report. Those two phrases are, uh, are um, for the most part, interchangeable. And it is a standard means by which IT vendors can provide documentation on whether and how they meet accessibility standards. So the latest version is 2.4. Um, and we say in our, the RFP language that I shared earlier, version 2.3 or higher is, is required for our purposes. If we're asking a vendor to document how, how well do they meet WCAG 2.1 level 2A, since that is our standard, then the only way they can answer that is with VPAT 2.3 or higher, because that's when uh, WCAG 2.1 was addressed within the template. So earlier versions did not support WCAG 2.1. So it's important actually not to get confused by the versioning <clears throat> that, that WCAG is on the 2.x series. VPAT is also on the 2.x series. And that's just a coincidence. Uh, they really have nothing to do with each other. So uh, the WCAG 2.1, VPAT 2.3, um, that 2.1 2 and 2.3 have nothing to do with each other. It's just, just a coincidence. So keep those you know, versions separate. Within um, the, the VPAT 2.3, there actually are four different versions or four different editions and those correspond with different accessibility standards. So since we are trying to meet WCAG 2.1, then that's the addition that we want a vendor to provide to us. Um, if they provide us with the Section 508 edition, then that's the standard required by federal agencies, but not, it's not what we're looking for. It doesn't answer the questions that we're looking for. Same thing with the European Union standards, EN301549. That's not going to be applicable to us. We want the WCAG version. Um, I added a parenthetical statement here because it just came up last week, actually, that we might actually be required in some context to provide a VPAT. Um, so this is pretty rare. Usually we're asking vendors to provide VPATs to us. But... Um, we, we had a, a kind of a frantic request last week because um, a, a, a group at the UW um, was asked to provide a VPAT in order to receive federal funding. So federal agencies are um, required to meet Section 508. And so um, I don't know how, how common this is or it's about to be. Um, I haven't heard of it happening much, but but it might be that um, that you, if you're getting federal funding, 
might be required to provide a VPAT that says, you know, the information technology that we're offering to users uh, is accessible. So it's important to know, you know, uh, and if you have to fill out your own VPAT, you're going to need to know more than, than you know, what we're covering here. But uh, we, we are happy to help with accessible technology services, you know, if questions arise about this stuff. There is a, a fourth edition that is the international version, the INT version, and that incorporates all of the above standards. And so if a vendor, you know, does business, you know, with federal agencies in the U.S. as well as uh, with European um, businesses, then they may, in fact, um, uh, just fill out an INT version because it covers everything. Um, and so that would be acceptable for us too, the INT version and the WCAG version. So this is what a blank VPAT looks like. Um, it essentially is three columns. There's criteria, which will vary if you're using a Section 508 or European Union version. But for the WCAG version, what we have for criteria are the WCAG um, success criteria. So that's what we're seeing there. And it specifies whether they're level A or level 2A. Then there is a conformance level column and a remarks and explanations column. The conformance level is actually a multiple choice column. So vendors are expected to, to claim either their product supports this success criterion or it partially supports it, which means some functionality of the product does not meet the criteria, but most of, mostly it does. Does not support means the majority of the product functionality does not meet the criteria. So there is kind of a you know, sort of partly cloudy, partly sunny distinction there. Um, you know, is it does not support or is it partially supports? A vendor may opt to say partially supports because it sounds better. But um, if you read the fine details, you may discover that really it's a does not support. There's so many exceptions that um, th this just is not, not a well-supported uh, product in terms of that particular success criteria. There's also a not applicable and not evaluated uh, option for, um, for, uh, for the conformance level column. The most important column in a VPAT is that third column, remarks and explanations, where detailed remarks are provided to justify what they said in the middle column. So they, they choose partially supports, then we want to know what, especially what does not meet the criteria, because um, that really helps us to understand, you know, the limitations of this product. Even if they say supports, we want to see remarks and explanations. We want to know why they say that, that their product supports the success criterion, because that gives us a lot more information about how usable this product is going to be and how much the vendor understands what's being asked of them. So, so we've asked for accessibility from vendors and they've responded um, by giving us a VPAT, hopefully. And now we're at step two, we need to validate the accessibility information that we have received. So looking further at the VPAT, First of all, there, there is required metadata at the top of the VPAT. There are actually 11 required fields, very, very clearly identified in the instructions as being required. And um, I picked five that I, I think are especially critical. Uh, one is the name of the product and the version. So we know that what we're looking at is a match for you know, the product that we're going to be using. Uh, the report date is also important. So, you know, it was this, this VPAT two years old or more? If so, does that mean they haven't made any changes in two years to the product? Or is the VPAT itself out of date? Um, contact information. And that shouldn't just be a generic help um, you know, email. It should be a, a specific person or a specific group that can answer questions about accessibility. Somebody filled out the VPAT. We would love to be able to talk to that person to ask follow-up questions. Uh, evaluation methods used. Uh, how did they fill this out? Um, yeah, how did they evaluate their product? What tools did they use? Um, this helps us to understand uh, whether the VPAT is credible or not. And 
what standards and guidelines um, are, are being reported here that should be obvious from the version of the addition of the VPAT that they've chosen, um, but just it just reinforces that you know we are reporting here on WCAG 2.1 level 2A. So a quick guide to reading a VPAT, if you're not an accessibility professional, um, you can still get a lot by um, just sort of exploring the VPAT with these questions in mind. First of all, who completed the VPAT? Uh, we're seeing more and more VPATs that are, that are filled out by an independent accessibility consultant, and that is preferred um, because, you know, that is, it, it's a trusted, credible uh, source and, um, and uh, presumably independent. Although uh, even that should be scrutinized carefully because, you know, how did they test a product? Um, well, probably the vendor provides them with a few functional workflows to test. Uh, they can't test everything uh, for products that are especially complex. And so, um, you know, the results they come up with are gonna be a little bit influenced by, you know, the relationship with the vendor. Um, did they follow instructions? Um, you know, those the required metadata fields, if they didn't do that, or if they, you know, filled out the form itself incorrectly, then that may suggest that the VPAT is either new to them or it's not something that they take seriously. Do they seem to be knowledgeable, knowledgeable of accessibility? And this is where, again, just knowing a little something about those three success criteria that I just mentioned, you can really hone in on those and see if their answers make sense, given what you now know. Finally, the last two bullets are really what this is all about. Um, after reading the VPAT, do you know more about the accessibility of the product? And after reading the VPAT, what follow-up questions do you have for the vendor? Um, this is just a conversation starter, so that's important to know too, and to keep in mind that it's not the absolute truth when they give you a VPAT, you know, we can't say, okay, they claim everything's accessible, so we're good. Um, this is a, 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 an entry point to having a conversation with them about, the, about their product and about the accessibility of their product. And so um, as you're reading it, keep an eye out for follow-up questions that uh, might arise. So I wanna look at uh, just a few quick examples. Um, Here's one, and these are all real world examples that have um, crossed my desk over the last few years. Um, here's, here's one, you got your criteria, you got your performance level. Uh, most are, well, there's kind of a, a mix of partially supports and not applicable and supports. What do you think of this VPAT? What jumps out at you as being good, bad, potentially problematic? Feel free to, since we've got a small group, uh, unmute and speak or type into chat. Either one is fine. It looks to me like you're missing a whole column. Indeed. And Anna, you raised your hands that you are about to say that. <laughs> Yeah, they, so the VPAT is a Word doc, and so people can do whatever they want with it. It's intended to be editable. Um, but in this case, they, they chopped off the third column. So there are no remarks and explanations. And I, as I said, you know, that's the most important column. And we have no idea what partially supports for non-text content means, um, you know, or for any of those things. We don't have any idea, you know, what to make of that, and we know nothing more about their accessibility by looking at this. What about VPAT 2? This is another, we've got the really bad ones first. <laughs> Anna? Your audio is not Sorry. so great. There you go. Okay. So, yeah, so we have the third column, but that information is not even helpful. And basically, they just keep on pasting the same comment instead of explaining the actual uh, explanation. Yeah. 
And I, I find it interesting that they they felt a need to define not applicable. It's like, that's the one thing that probably re doesn't require any additional explanation, but but they did define that and didn't say anything about um, support, support, supports. Yes, Anne, you're muted. I thought I had that undone. Um, I, I actually have a question about the not applicable. Is that, is is that a is that a is that incorrect? I mean, does everything on the list in that first column does it need to have a, a conformance level and is not applicable? Um, does it is that considered a conformance term? Does there have to be an activity in there like like the supports? Yeah, great. Great question. Um, not applicable is a valid response. Um, and ideally, there will be some remarks um, that explain why. But it, this comes up most frequently with things like, if you look at 1.2.1, .1, audio only and video only. And then there's a whole series there that are related to audio and video. Mm -hmm. So ca captions, audio description. Um, if this is a product that has nothing to do with video and doesn't support video or audio, um, then those would be not applicable, um, you know, for this product. And then in the third column, that's what they would say is that this particular product doesn't support some, some, something like that. Exactly. Is that, yep. is that what they're saying about Criterion is not relevant? Is that what they're trying to say? Or is that just too generic of a description? I think actually... In this case, that would be okay, um, you know, for this product that, uh, although they use it for so many things. Which is what Anna pointed which, out. Yeah, and I, I I have a hard time believing that all of those success criteria are not applicable um, for the product. And they've given me nothing to, to um, you know, no remarks and explanations for the items that they call supports. And so there's just not enough information here for me to think this is a credible VPAT. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if they have lots of information for why they feel their product supports um, if the success criteria that get a supports rating, mm -hmm. then I would believe they're not applicable um, or be more likely to believe that. But in this case, I just feel like they probably didn't understand, you know, the VPAT. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So example three much more information now, finally, in the third column, uh, just looking at 2.1.1, the success criteria related to keyboard, they say the product partially supports, and in remarks, they say all functionality of the content is operable through a keyboard interface without requiring specific timings for individual keystrokes. However, there are minor exceptions. For example, the calendar widget on the manage section is not keyboard operable. However, alternatively, the date can be directly entered into the date field. So just imagine that um, most things are keyboard accessible, but this is one exception that they've acknowledged. Um, and it, it is the calendar widget is not accessible, but there is a workaround. So even if a per person can't trigger that calendar widget, they can still enter a date. So what are your thoughts about this, um, this response? Okay, I want to raise my hand again. I don't know. I'm shooting in the dark. But uh, if, how does the person who is filling in the date know what is operable and what is not? So that, I, I, again, I'm trying to learn and understand. So that's what stands out to me is that the calendar widget is not keyboard operable, but they can enter a, a date directly into the field. Is that is that a confusion? That's it's a good question, and it's it's also important to just uh, keep in mind we're just thinking about keyboard accessibility. Okay. So it gets bigger than that if you start trying to think about how's the screen reader user going to going to interact with us, you know, and those kind of questions. So okay. that's all separate, um, just keyboard only. You're tabbing through. You get to this date field. You discover that you can't you can't, can't get to the calendar widget. There's no way to pop that up without a mouse. 
Um, but you can enter a, a date field. You can enter the date into this field. And so for me, the, the takeaway, and if I'm just trying to get, get a sense for whether the vendor knows what they're talking about, they do speak intelligently about this item, that they are describing it, um, you know, accurately. This is what this success criteria is all about, is being able to do things with keyboard um, exclusively. I also like that they're being transparent, that they are acknowledging that this widget is problematic and that there's a workaround. All of those things to me are positive. We can get into a debate then about how critical it is that a keyboard user be able to access the calendar widget, because that is different than entering a date. You know, they can see the month and they can, you know, if they're not sure what date to pick, but they know it was on a Friday, you know, there are certain advantages to actually having access to the calendar widget. Um, so this seems like a nice, uh, workaround, um, but and that's a bigger question, you know. There might be a dialogue with the vendor to, uh, you know, sort of um, figure that out. Yes, Anya. I had a question. So this is the what we're covering here is the interaction between um, the university, say, procurement and the vendor. The VPAT potentially provides really helpful user information. Do we pass any of this on currently to the users? Um, not necessarily. And the, the VPAT, we actually do uh, within the Accessible Technology website, we're in the, the very early stages of creating a set of web pages that documents um, different products. And within right. that, if there are VPATs available, we will be linking to those VPATs. And so that would be one source of information. Uh, but the, the VPAT is not easy reading. And I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. you know, expect users to turn to that as their source for understanding you know, the interface. Hopefully, you know, companies that, that are serious about accessibility will provide public facing documentation of you know, keyboard shortcuts for using this product or you know, instructions for how to use this product with assistive technologies, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And so, um, so those same pages will link to, um, you know, to that content as well, specifically for, for users. So the so VPAT this really... Is the, this is what you and I touched on the other day, right? right. In terms of like yeah. a next step could be to actually provide guidance to our users on the products we operate. Right. Got it. Thanks. Yep. Yep. The VPAT really is intended for people making purchasing decisions so they can better understand the limitations of, of the product. So one, one more example. Um, this, again, is focusing on the keyboard success criteria, 2.1.1. They say partially supports. They say a rating of partially supports has been given because users can operate all functions in the product using keyboard through standard controls, um, but there are some, some limitations. And once again, they have you know, two, two limitations that are specifically identified. Um, the reason that I uh, selected this one is because it also um, says at the bottom, a roadmap has been identified to remediate both of these known issues. And so this, you know, in the um, how to read a VPAT slide, one of the questions was, what follow-up questions do you have when you're interacting with a vendor? And the biggest follow-up question, if they have identified accessibility problems, should be, when are you going to fix those problems? You've identified, you've got, you know, all these problems. They're very specific if it's a good VPAT. Um, what's your status on fixing those or what's your roadmap? And, you know, we're, if we're going to deploy this now and we know that it has risks because you've identified it's got accessibility problems, we need to know when those are going to be fixed. You know, maybe we, we hold off on deploying it until those are fixed, or maybe we hold off on signing the contract until those are fixed. So... This is where contract negotiation comes in. Um, you know, they've identified problems. Now, what do we do? And that 
It is a perfect handoff to Lynn. And I'll, I'll just keep driving if you like, Lynn, and you oh. can uh, speak. No, that sounds great. Thank you, Terrell. And to Terrell's prior point also about um, getting requests from the federal um, customers about documentation, we've also been getting that for data security as well. And so we're seeing a high trend in that right now in federally funded grants and contracts also. Um, so step three, you know, we've talked about what to look for in the vendor. And I always use an analogy, you know, I, I tend to lean a lot towards car analogies. And it's a lot, you know, they're giving you VPATs and that's great, but without any teeth to it, without anything in the contract, it's pretty much what we call in the procurement world is sales collateral. You know, someone might tell you this car runs great, you know, it looks good on the outside. I'll give you a sheet of paper telling you all the things we've done. But unless when you drive it off the lot, you have some type of warranty that says if it doesn't do those things, then it's on you. Then it's as is at that point and it's on you to fix it. And so that's what we're going to talk about next is how to partner with the vendor to make sure that they can essentially back up what they're telling you in the VPATs. And so if I could get the next slide, that would be wonderful. And so one of our um, key things that we do in procurement, and I recognize that not everybody has a procurement department, depending on where you're from. And I speak um, to an audience in these presentations because since this is a public presentation, not everybody is always from the UW. Companies are structured differently. At the University of Washington, we have um, a procurement department that helps us with contracts. That's my department. Um, but not all companies do that. Sometimes it's a one-stop shop or, you know, somebody is a, a person of all trades that will be doing all of these tasks themselves. And so if you engage with your users as early as possible and start talking about these requirements up front as part of the negotiation process, that's really key. Because if whoever is negotiating your agreements, be that you or somebody else, if they've negotiated everything else and then you come in at the 11th hour and go, hello, I need to get in some accessibility language, they're gonna feel a lot like, you know, you've done a bait and switch on them. And that happens a lot in contract negotiation where, you know, if there's multiple layers of review or something wasn't thought out on the front end, getting something in after everybody has negotiation fatigue can be a little difficult. And so, Whatever your role is in accessibility, make sure that you're involved in the process before that decision is made so that you can set the table and the expectations with the vendor and they don't feel like we're, um, we're like a ShamWow commercial, but wait, there's more. And I'm gonna keep putting the, you know, we're dragging out the negotiation and everybody, you know, in, timeline is impacted. And so if you have other process partners, such as an accessibility team like Terrell, or a CIO and they need to be involved in that process or you don't know how to read a VPAT, um, then that's a good time to get them involved early so that we're, you're not doing that at the very end of the process. And next slide, please. And so how do you do that? And so, you know, where does it fit in? How does this work? And so at the university, we embed the policy into our boilerplate terms and our website information. And so every purchase order that goes out to our vendors says, you know, this is in you know, conformance with or subject to the terms of UW general terms and conditions. And in those terms and conditions, accessibility is embedded in there. However, in custom negotiated contracts or other ones that we um, review and know involve um, IT or accessibility items, we put a physical writer in, and we'll get to that in a moment. But when we post all of our solicitations out to vendors and our request for proposals or quotations, um, we put an accessibility clause in there so that when bidders bid on this, they understand that this is what the university is looking for. And this is what's going to be expected if you get this bid. So you should tell us up front whether or not you can comply with this so that when we're, we have all the proposals in front of us, we can pick one that you know, conforms with our accessibility requirements. And the key part of all this is 
to be enforceable, it must be actually in the documents. Um, you know, unfortunately, handshake deals and emails and someone saying, yes, we're really good at this, we're accessible, that's not enforceable later. And especially if they change their website or their um, solution later, if they make modifications to it to make it less accessible, then that can be a problem. Um, I had that happen to a department where we hired a vendor to provide us with videos. They were captioned, they were accessible, um, everything was great. And then not long before deployment, they changed their solution and they made some changes and they took away all the captioning. And they didn't know, we tried to work with them and get it going and they didn't know you know, when they could fix it. And it was a, a key component for us since it was being rolled out to a lot of students. And so we actually ended up canceling the contract and going with a different vendor because that was a requirement in the contract that they agreed to and they changed and could no longer meet it. And that's a very drastic um, example. Usually your end goal is to never switch vendors and go through that whole process again. If you can avoid it, working with them and having them be responsive is best case scenario and ideal for all parties. Um, but in that particular case, the vendor had no option for us and no resolution. And so on our team, we train everybody about IT writers and accessibility. It's built into our standard core processes and our standard IT writers. And so if there's a vendor that says, well, we might be accessible or we don't understand, and we get a lot of departments who say, Lynn, I'm not an accessibility expert and the vendor's telling me they can do X, Y, Z, and I'm not sure how to read this VPAT, what do I do? And that's where we bring in Terrell and say, absolutely, we have a partner that can help you. Um, but part of this training that Terrell and I are doing today is also geared towards people who may not have a Terrell and a team like Terrell and Anna and so, or Anne Marie. And so they might have to say, oh, I need to review the VPAT myself in my organization to make this happen. And so the tools that Terrell gave you will help you vet that accessibility and say, okay, you know, this vendor is mostly accessible. They have one little thing that is not accessible and only two people are using this. That's probably maybe okay. Or, ooh, this, this is really not accessible at all. And we're gonna roll this out to thousands of people. That's kind of a big risk. You know, what happens? And I, you know, happen to know that some of the people using this, you know, need accessibility tools. And so that's where you come in and say, okay, you know, I'm buying this car, I'm buying this product, um, you know, does it need, you know, a new headlight, which is easily fixable, or does it have a long list of repairs, and I'm getting ready to drive across country, you know, what are my real risks in buying this thing, and that's part of risk, accept, uh, risk assessment when you're looking at these, and so when you decide to accept accessibility that is um, less than desirable or less than perfect. You can do that, but it should be somebody who understands those risks. That, it, you know, if someone said, Lynn, you were hired at the university yesterday, can you approve this deviation and this risk? And I probably wouldn't even know how to find my desk or who to email at that point. I might not be the right person to be making that choice. So in our organization, we usually have a director or an executive level supervisor make those decisions because the financial impact of the product not being accessible rests with their department and they should know and understand those risks or know who to consult. You know, they might say, well, I'm not an accessibility expert either, but I know how to get a hold of Terrell's team. And so, and I know how to get the tools I need to make that decision for my team. And so that's kind of where we come in in the process is making sure that it's official and it's just not a, a nice to have sales collateral from the actual vendors. So next slide, please. And this is a sample. This isn't our whole writer. Um, we have a two page writer that we've worked with with Terrell and we update it periodically, but we actually embed this in our terms and we physically attach it to all POs and contracts. And it actually goes and spells out liability requirements, accessibility requirements. 
And is it negotiable? Absolutely. Um, but those edits you know, need to be reviewed by somebody who understands and is responsible for agreeing to those edits. You know, sometimes if it's something minor, you know, Lynn, there's a typo, or Lynn, we can do this, or let's point back to the indemnity in the contract rather than the indemnity here. You know, if you understand indemnity and can connect those two things, and you're the responsible party for negotiating, which our team is, um, you can sometimes help with that. Um, if they sometimes make other edits, such as commercially reasonable or things like that, that impact what the accessibility really means, then you might want to get somebody else involved and talk about that. And normally our team will work with you. If you're at the UW, we'll work with you on this and Carol. Um, we see the term commercially reasonable tossed around a lot, not just at accessibility, but for a lot of things. And what that means in practice is um, if it isn't hard, it doesn't cost any effort or there's no real definition to commercially reasonable. So for one company, commercially reasonable could mean if it doesn't cost us any money or effort, or another company might say, well, minimal effort, we'll do it if it's not too hard. And since there's no real standard, they could come back and say, we don't have to do anything because we don't feel it's commercially reasonable at all. So that basically negates your entire writer and all of those good reviews that you did. They put in a little disclaimer that says, you know, if we want it. And that's kind of what that means. And so you have to watch the edits to the writers. Um, like anything, it is, you know, negotiable, but you want to make sure that you understand what you're agreeing to and what those things actually mean in practice for you. And so that is all I have on my piece. And I think it'd probably be a great time to open it up to any questions or comments or anything else we can help with. Thank you, Terrell. And thank you for driving. Thank you, Lynn. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, I haven't really been following chat. Looks like there are a few things. Maybe those have all been addressed. Anybody else have uh, questions, comments from, from your experiences? I'm curious, what is the, how would you how would you rate the the level of maturity we have as an institution in this space, Lynn, in the in the procurement area? I would say that we are um, one of the leaders in the university space in this. Um, yeah, you know, we do have. Carol works a lot more with peer institutions in this space than I do. But because we are an R1 and we're so large, um, we are actually a leader rolling this out. And one of Terrell's colleagues, um, and of course, my Cheryl Bergstaller has written two books on this topic. And so we're very fortunate to have that in-house as well. Um, but we have a lot of our, a lot of smaller institutions that ask us for assistance. And so when we teach procurement classes and IT specifically is one that a lot of other institutions struggle with because they may not have a whole procurement team or even an IT department or their procurement person. One institution that uh, at a convention that I went to, they actually were so short staffed, they were hauling boxes at the loading dock. Um, in addition to doing procurement, reconciling pro cards and doing a bunch of other stuff. And so they may not have even remotely have the type of resources that we're fortunate to have. And so they attend some of our classes and say, how do I do this and how do I get this in here? And so I would say our level of maturity is, is pretty good, you know, especially because Terrell's taught even you know, I've, I'm late to the game on teaching classes with him the past couple of years, but he's been teaching them long before I have. So, Thank you. I've just been fortunate enough to be included as, you know, how well, this is great. How do we get it into our actual process? So it's been a wonderful partnership for us. We'll say, and I don't know if you're encountering this, Lynn, in your um, conversations with others in the procurement space, but I, I am discovering more and more institutions that have accessibility as an official um, step in the procurement approval process. So yeah, every every purchase above a certain um, dollar threshold 
has to go through accessibility and accessibility has to sign off on that um, before it can proceed. And so I don't know, you know how common that is and whether that's you know maybe smaller institutions as opposed to R1s, but I am hearing of more institutions that do have you know, a pretty formal um, seat at the table. No, that's wonderful. I just got back from an IT conference last week that was not university focused. It was um, for commercial and there were very few higher eds actually there. And there were over, I think, 4,310 people at the conference. And there were a good 300 vendors, I believe. And some of the vendors did presentations. And I think I saw maybe one presentation on accessibility. And I did not see any discussion about it in this entire conference, which is one of the biggest in the nation. And so, you know, we're very much ahead of the curve. And I actually sat next to a, a person at IBM who is not a small player in the market. And um, they actually looked at me and they said, you know, who's really thinking about accessibility in the market anyway? And I looked at her, I said, we are, <laughs> you know? So the sales rep at IBM was actually shocked that this was even remotely on our radar and their perception was that this is not an important thing. And our perception is drastically different. Samantha, you had your, your hand up a little earlier. Did you, you still have a question? Um, I guess I was just hoping, um, hi everyone, I'm Samantha I'm, um, at the information school and I was wondering what the process is for getting a contract checked before we um, close out on it with a vendor. You know, when would we loop your team in? Are you saying um, your team is in Terrell's team or my team? Oh, sorry. Um, Terrell's team. Um, anytime, really, and if, anytime somebody has a question about accessibility of a product, you know, feel free to reach out to us and, you know, we're happy to entertain that. Um, I, I do get a lot of referrals from Lynn. And so, you know, as um, if it's a purchase that is going through procurement services, um, then, you know, I kind of, kind of trust that you know, Lynn knows the optimum time to, to bring us in and, and whether you know, our involvement is necessary. Um, but otherwise, you know, if something is being you know, considered or negotiated independently of procurement services, then yeah, feel free. Uh, with any questions about accessibility, feel free to reach out um, to us. Uh, help at uw.edu with you know, something very specifically about digital accessibility in the uh, subject and description. It will get triaged to us. Thanks. And with most contractual items, accessibility included, um, try to get in front of the vendor as soon as possible because sometimes they take a while to review things or they can take a while to negotiate. And if you're down to two days before you need to sign the contract, we pretty much don't have a whole lot of leverage at that point or a chance to switch vendors. Um, and we're seeing some last minute brinksmanship in the IT space where vendors will say, oh, you've got two months. Great. I'll have my legal team look at it. They'll go dark for six weeks. And then two days before it's due, they'll say, oh, no changes. Sorry, take it or leave it. And then you're left holding the bag and you have to say, OK, now I have this risky thing that I have to take on, um, which is not good. And I don't have any other I've you know been painted into a corner pretty much. And so you know, as early as possible is good. Mm -hmm. And if we see a vendor saying, you know, nope, I can't do this. And we, you know, you need help assessing the risk, then I'll bring in Terrell, absolutely. Or other process partners, we do that as well with privacy and the SISO as needed. If it's out in the weeds and beyond our capacity in what we do, then we are always delighted to bring them in. So it's good. Right. Well, we are at the top of the hour, and I, I know uh, folks are having to jump off for other meetings, and so um, we can uh, stop now, but appreciate everybody being here. Hopefully it's been informative.